It's a combination of many factors, right? So you, you got to look at success not only in the business life, but I think in everything that you do. And I think, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, definitely hard work. I mean, if, when you ask about, you know, people who work closely to me, they would say that hard work. I'm well known for that. And one of the leadership traits that I, do, that I tend to lead by is, is you got to practice what you preach, right? And, and, uh, and that's why, you know, people are surprised when they work, when they walk around the different price stores around the world, how they see, in many cases, we're called one of the hardest working companies in the world. And our customers love the fact that they can always count on us. I think on the personal side, I've been blessed, you know, blessed by having a good family, blessed by, you know, having the, you know, having had the choice to do whatever, whatever I enjoy. You know, one of my other hobbies that I have or my other jobs that I have is running Bolivia's largest professional soccer team. So, and, and we've been able to do things that have never been able to be done, such as taking the national team to the World Cup, which is almost an impossible task. And we're able to do that at my early age. So I think, you know, definitely hard work being in the right industry. We go back to Brightstar, you know, when we got into the world of mobile telephony, that was back in 1997, which was the start of a boom. You know, back then, I think they were selling about 20 million phones a year. This year, there's the, the market has grown to 1.6 billion mobile phones a year. So been in the right place. I, I think entrepreneurship is believing that you're capable of achieving a certain set of goals, right? And my first job when I graduated college was uh, I was flying back, you know, most international students due to our current immigration system that we have today, you know, you're forced to leave the U.S. or you're here for a very short period of time. So I was flying back and then I met a, I met a person in the plane who was the president of the Bolivian Federation, the Bolivian soccer team, just in the plane by pure coincidence. And then by the, by the time we landed in La Paz, that was six hours later, he, you know, we liked each other and he offered me the job to be his second person in command. My parents were a bit disappointed because, uh, you know, those are out of norm jobs, you don't get paid. But it was pretty neat to be the second person in command for the leading sport in my country. And, uh, you know, Bolivia had been trying to make it to the World Cup for more than 70 years. And what that gentleman told me, you know, was that everything is possible. So we actually, it was the first time ever, you know, that Brazil had ever lost a game that was against us in a qualifying round, or, or we beat Venezuela 7-0, which was the largest defeat as a visiting team in the history of Latin America. So, you know, taking Bolivia to the World Cup or being the second person in command definitely taught me that everything was possible. So, so when you fast forward and, and you come back to the U.S. to look for a job and you end up buying a store, you know, you think you're capable of anything. You set yourself some pretty hefty goals such as, hey, I want to be, I want to have a thousand stores. Why not? It's the same thing as I want to take Bolivia to the World Cup. And that taught me, you know, that pretty much I say, you know, it's, it's, you got to believe in yourself. You know, you got to have good goals. And, and, you know, as long as you work hard and you have clear ideas and you have a good team, you know, you're able to achieve stuff that otherwise, you know, you, you don't think you're capable of achieving. It's very, very strange that you find a company that was founded in Bolivia, in a small landlocked country of seven, eight million people, to actually, you know, become the leader of what we do in Latin America. And then it's hardly ever do you find a Latin American company coming to the U.S. market. It's backwards. Traditionally, you have European or, or American companies who go into Latin America. So this was one of those in which a Latin American company came. And then after that, we did Asia, you know, and then after Asia, we did Europe, and now we're doing Africa. And now we're in 61 different countries and, and you learn the challenges of, you know, running a global company. It's as much as it sounds great. I mean, it has a set of challenges, right? Set of challenges in terms of, you know, how can you really be global? But how can you truly be a local company providing local services? You know, how do you find the right management? How do you, how can you run a company that doesn't stop? I mean, it's 24 hours a day, you know, well, well, it might be Sunday in the U.S., you know, it's already the beginning of the day in Australia, or it's actually mid-afternoon in Australia. So those are the things that we're learning that we find it. I find it fascinating, you know, in terms of trying to keep a global organization motivated, you know, to continue to try to be number one at what we do. What we've done is something, it's a little different, right? I mean, traditionally, you know, we were a distribution company and we become the number one wireless distribution company in the world. We sell, you know, many, many millions of mobile phones. But then we decided to transform Brightstar into a services company. So we started becoming a supply chain solutions company. 
So we start fighting with companies that we, we had no idea we were. We, we, we compete against IBM, we compete against Accenture, we compete against UPS, and we want to be number one in that industry. Then, you know, after that, we, be, we also got into the insurance business. And insurance business is one where, you know, your cell phone today is your most prized possession, so you want to insure it versus it gets lost, gets damaged, and all that. So we bought a small insurance company, and our goal is to be the number one insurance company in the world. We entered the buyback and trading business. So what does that mean? It's at the end of your two-year contract with your carrier, you walk into an AT&T or a Verizon or a T-Mobile shop, and we're going to buy that used phone from you, and we're going to resell it into market. In that one, we're number one in the world. That took us a couple of years. You know, we enter into the retail business. You know, we when you walk into any Target shop in the U.S., it's Bryce are running it. So we want to become one of the leading, you know, retail outsourcing companies. And then lastly, you know, we're in the, in the financial services, so we bought a few banks, and now we're in the process of financing smartphones to consumers who otherwise, you know, cannot pay to have the $600, $700 it costs you to get in. So even though we're number one, the number one distribution company in the world, and we're the number one buyback and trading company in the world, we still have four other industries that's, that keeps us excited and keeps us motivated that we are far away from being number one in the world. So our goal is, you know, Every, every business unit or every industry that we enter, our goal is to strive to be number one in the world. And, and that, keeps, you know, the, that keeps my group of, uh, of colleagues and employees all over the world highly motivated because those are, you know, those are hard goals to achieve. But we've proven that we can do it in some industries, so that keeps us going. You know, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, this has been you know, my primary job. You know what you try to do is always to hire great talent. You know, so you try to surround it, try to surround yourself to talent that's better than yours. And you know that's been my personal goal. I mean, so that way you try to work a little less. And and I think you know so far so good. You know, you're able to recruit great talent of actually employees that come and can teach you a lot. You know, in terms of other people that have learned, uh, you know, how to run bigger companies. As as this has been the only job that I've had. You know, it's been ru running a soccer team and and running Brister and putting it to what it is today. So from a personal goal, I definitely, you know, you know, is recruit great talent. Then also, you know, from a personal goal, so obviously family becomes quite important, you know, in terms to be able to provide as much time as your family needs, you know, which is n easier said than done. And then also, you know, now that I, now that I bought Bolivia's largest uh, football team or soccer team, you know, is how do you make it one of the leading teams in the world? And, and that one is a, uh, quite a challenge but you know we're better every year we get better so that definitely keeps me I'm very very excited so one laptop per child came uh, you know uh, when Nicolas Negroponte you know who used to run the MIT Media Lab called uh, a group of us it was at that point Larry from Google he was a uh, Rupert Murdoch from News Corp he was the founder of Red Hat and they sat us down on the table and they say I want to make the I want to make computers or laptops available to everyone I want to be able to do it for under $100. The original name was with $100 laptops. And we didn't get to $100 laptops, we got to $180. But if you look at the best thing that we did, apart from giving kids, I think over 5 million computers in emerging markets and allow them to be connected to the internet, what we've given the world is, is we've had the price of laptops drop dramatically after we introduced. And it's fair to say that because of what we did, the emergence of netbooks exists today. And that is, you know, we took away I would say all the unnecessary things that went into a computer, into a laptop, to make it uh, accessible and affordable to everyone. So, you know, the joy and the pleasure of walking into your wife, for example, and seeing that every single kid has a computer and every single kid is connected, you know, it's a, I mean, there's no better, I call there's no better encyclopedia than the Internet. And the Internet is the only democratic, I mean, source of information where it doesn't matter how rich or how poor you are, you're accessing the exact same information. So I took a lot of pride in, in being the leader of that with Nicholas and, and seeing millions and millions of kids who otherwise would never have access to the Internet today, you know, just be better students, you know, be better brothers and be better, you know, be better citizens and understanding, you know, what's the whole world like as well. Mm. I think the Kennedy schools, uh, any school students, you know, you're privileged. You're privileged to be one of the best, uh, if not the best, uh, teaching institution in the world. And therefore, you know, I have a higher degree of responsibility in terms of grabbing what you've learned in these last four, six, or as many years that you've been here and being taken back to your community, to your country, 
you know, to the companies that you're going to end up working or from a Kennedy perspective, you know, you most likely you'll be in the, in the public service arena. So therefore you have high expectations and what works in business in terms of, you know, setting yourself to hefty goals and believing you can achieve, you know, and be the best at what you do that applies for your politician or that applies for your public servant, whatever that's going to be.